If you tend to be skeptical, ideas like the power of positive thinking or the law of attraction from the book The Secret can be really difficult to wrap your head around. How can beliefs be so powerful? How can thinking something about yourself or others actually make a change just by thinking about it? And can science even prove this? Well, in fact, yes. Psychologists have found evidence to support that your beliefs can make a big change, even when those beliefs reflected false truths about something or someone. Some of this evidence lies in the idea of a self-fulfilling prophecy. In this video, I'm going to be explaining what a self-fulfilling prophecy is and how research has proven that even a false truth can be made real with just the powers of belief. Self-fulfilling prophecies have changed the lives of people throughout history and has become the basic plotline for a number of movies, plays, and books. But what exactly is it, a self-fulfilling prophecy? Robert Burton was a sociologist and psychologist who grew up in South Philadelphia. He created the term self-fulfilling prophecy while studying at Harvard University. According to him, a self-fulfilling prophecy is a false definition about a situation evoking a new behavior which makes the originally false conception become true. Many believe that Merton's own upbringing played a big part in his creation of the self-fulfilling prophecy. He was born to Eastern European immigrants and lived in the poor area of South Philadelphia. He was also growing up during a time in which the American dream promised prosperity and wealth to immigrants who came to America and worked hard. The idea of a self-fulfilling prophecy actually isn't that far off from the law of attraction, the power of positive thinking, and other ideas about basic manifestation. If you believe something about yourself, you will continue to embody those beliefs whether or not they are true. But the self-fulfilling prophecy works in a cycle and can explain how prejudice, bias, and snap judgments about others can actually have a bigger impact than you might originally think. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how the cycle works, because self-fulfilling prophecies work in a cycle. We first have a belief about ourselves. Maybe it's that we're actually able to take on a certain project at work, or maybe it's that we're helpless, that what we do doesn't matter. These beliefs then influence our actions. If you believe you can take on the world, for example, you may confidently go out and run for city council. Other people will see your actions and they'll start to have beliefs about you too. They see your confidence and efforts to change the world, which come from your beliefs, and they think, wow, that person really can take on the world. Those people then begin to act in a way that reflects those beliefs. For example, they might vote for you. They might tell your neighbors that you're confident or that you know what you're doing, and they may applaud you at a town hall. Then you start to see those actions. You see those people clapping for you, and you feel the support of your townspeople. These events confirm your original beliefs about yourself, and the cycle begins again. Of course, this cycle can be broken or infiltrated at any stage, and the sad thing is that this cycle works even if your thoughts are negative. If someone has low expectations of you from the get-go, you may start to fulfill those expectations. Self-fulfilling prophecies do not have to start with the beliefs you have about yourself. And as you'll see throughout the studies and some of my examples of this phenomenon, you'll realize that we impose self-fulfilling prophecies on others all the time. Whenever society tells you that everyone who is a certain race or gender or religion or other differentiating factors is a good person or a bad person, it can be really tempting to fall into those roles yourself and continue a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm going to talk a little bit about an interview. Multiple studies have been conducted on how self-fulfilling prophecies play out in interviews whenever the interview subject is perceived to be more or less qualified than others. On one hand, if an attractive woman is brought in for an interview, the interviewer is much more likely to be kind and friendly toward the interview subject. The warm energy and the open body language is well received by the interviewee, who then does better throughout the conversation. In one well-known study described in The Nonverbal Mediation of Self-Fulfilling Prophecies and in Interracial Interactions, researchers put white and African-American interview subjects in front of white interviewers. When the researchers observed the interviewers as they talked to white and the African-American interviewees, they noticed significant differences in body language. The African-American candidates were also given an interview on average that was 25% shorter than the white candidates. This study was conducted in 1974, but given the rhetoric that still exists against minority groups and women, it still strikes an uncomfortable chord today. So I'm going to go into some examples of the self-fulfilling prophecy. An example number one is the Great Depression. So how powerful is a self-fulfilling prophecy? One can say that it could even cause depression or a recession that affects the lives of everyone in a whole country. You might be wondering, how? Well, the fears of a recession change the way that people handle their money. In the case of a recession, consumers may withhold their money and spend less. Even if the average consumer spends 5% less than they previously did, estimates say that the entire GDP of a country could drop by 3.5%. And in the case of the Great Depression, fears about failing banks, just the beliefs about it, led people to withdraw all of their money from the banks. Now, as we know, the banks couldn't cover such dramatic changes, and eventually, they crashed. 
Example number two of a self-fulfilling prophecy is marriage material. A self-fulfilling prophecy can also affect who you end up spending your whole life with. Whenever you enter into a relationship, you might have some expectations about where the relationship is going to go or how the person will fit into your life. You might take one look at a person and think that they're absolutely great marriage material. You then date them and you're patient with them and you put a lot of effort into your relationship with them. The person gets the hint that you're serious and if they believe that you're also marriage material, they will then reciprocate the same commitment to the relationship. However, it also works the other way. The opposite may happen. If you believe that someone is a quick fling, you're less likely to date them or court them and take the relationship seriously. And that sends a message too. And the other person is less likely to stick around. Example number three is Oedipus. Now the Oedipus complex is not an example of a self-fulfilling prophecy, but the story of Oedipus is. And there are plenty of classic stories and myths and stuff about self-fulfilling prophecies, but if you don't know about the story of Oedipus, here's a really quick summary. Oedipus is born, and his father is told that Oedipus is destined to kill his father and marry his mother. It's kind of weird, I know. But upon hearing the news, Oedipus' father abandons him and leaves him to die. That way, the destiny can't come true. Well, anyways, Oedipus is found by another family, and he hears about his tragic fate. So, in order to avoid killing his father, who actually raised him, not his real father, he leaves his adopted family. Shortly after, he gets into a fight with his actual father, and he kills him. Then he eventually marries the man's widow, which he eventually learns is his mother. The prophecy is fulfilled. Fairy tales, stories from A Thousand and One Nights, and Macbeth also contain tales with self-fulfilling prophecies. And of course, these are fiction, but they're all written to comment on the actual phenomenon of the self-fulfilling prophecy. Another example I have for you is hockey. Did you know that 40% of great hockey players are born between January and March? And there's an answer for why this occurs. It has to do with the self-fulfilling prophecy. So in Canada, hockey teams cut off age groups starting on January 1st. So the kids who were born in January and March are actually months older than the kids that were born in April through December. A kid born in January can be almost a whole year older than a kid that is born in December. And when you're still growing, those 11 months can make a big difference, especially on body size. Well, those kids born in January through March are much more likely to be bigger and taller than the younger kids, and this gives them a serious advantage. And because of this advantage, coaches are more likely to start to focus on them and give them extra practice. All of that extra attention, it pays off. And this is the theory why hockey players born between January and March are much more likely to go into the professional leagues. Lastly, there's something else I want to teach you. It's called the Pygmalion Effect. So researchers have tested out the idea of a self-fulfilling prophecy, which is also known as the Pygmalion Effect. Robert Rosenthal and Lenore Jacobson conducted the first experiments on the Pygmalion Effects in the 1960s. Rosenthal and Jacobson chose a group of students at random and told their teachers that they were given a special test. Now the results of that test showed that the students were growth spurters. In reality, the test scores didn't necessarily show that the students stood out from their peers, but the teachers didn't know that. Anyways, at the end of the year, the researchers look at how the students did. The ones that were considered growth spurters actually made significant improvements over the course of the year. They were much smarter, they did much better on the tests. So the interesting thing about this study is that the children actually didn't know about the supposed results of the test. It was only the teachers that knew about it. And what this showed is it proved that the belief that the teachers had about the students was a catalyst in the students' improvement. So think about this for a minute. Your childhood success in school is largely based on the beliefs that your teachers had about you. <laughs> How crazy is that? I think that's ridiculous. Anyway, moving on, the Pygmalion effect is a positive thing when you think about it in experiments like the one with the growth spurters. But think about the ways the opposite Pygmalion effect occurs in everyday life. When media, including the news and movies, tell you that one group of people is violent, how could that impact how you treat them or how those people view themselves? When influential figures tell you that a group of people is less deserving of rights or that they're inherently greedy, how could that play into self-fulfilling prophecies? It all comes back to that the students had no part in the study mentioned earlier, but they were affected. So take a look at your own life. What stereotypes or judgments or beliefs might be holding you back from success? And how can you change your beliefs and then your actions to make a more positive impact on your life and eventually the lives of others? I want to thank you guys so much for watching this video. I love creating videos like this, and I hope that you learned something a little bit more about the self-fulfilling prophecy and something called the Pygmalion Effect. If you have any questions about this at all, feel free to leave a comment below, or you can watch the rest of my videos in the Social Psychology series. Thank you so much for watching.